This 10th year of Daily Tech News show is made possible by you, the listener. Thanks to every single one of you, including Tony Glass, Philip Less, Daniel Dorado, and everybody welcome our brand new patron, Mark. Yay, welcome, Mark. Mark. On this episode of DTNS, who should decide the rules on AI? Is Google Maps the new Yelp? Antasia Custody reviews the AI features of the Pixel 8 Pro. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, October 27th, 2023 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Secret Bunker, I'm Sarah Lane. John, the top tech stories from Cleveland. I am Len Peralta. And I'm the show's producer, Roger J. Joining us is YouTuber and host of AI Name This Show and the Talk Techie to Me podcast, Tasia Custody. Welcome back. Hello, everybody. Thanks for having me again. Thank Good you for you being back. here. It, is this the first time we've been on? Have you yes. been on? Yeah, that's right. Because you've been on with Sarah, but not I wasn't around for those. So this is I awesome. thought it was me. But no, now I, I see you're not me. avoiding me. So. I thought you were like, which day is Tom off? Yeah. Turns out <laughs> you and Tom are going to get along well. I think so. I think yeah. we'll be just fine. Uh, there is no bad blood between us. Let's start <laughs> with the quick hits. I don't have any Taylor Swift uh, jokes to make about this next story, but two days after California suspended GM-owned Cruise's license to test autonomous cars without safety drivers, Cruise announced it has paused all operations that don't include a safety driver at all. Cruise had been operating services without safety drivers in Austin, Houston, Miami, and also Phoenix. In a post on X, the company said it will take time to examine its processes, systems, and tools and reflect on how we can better operate in a way that will earn public trust. Cruise also said it will continue with supervised autonomous vehicle operations, which means that a human safety operator will be behind the wheel. Huawei's launch of the Mate 60 Pro, powered by an advanced chip and 5G connectivity, has propelled the company to the head of the pack when it comes to smartphone sales in China, seeing a 37% year-on-year increase and getting a 12.9% market share in the quarter, up from 9.1% in the same period last year. That's all according to the numbers from CounterPoint Research. Honor, which is now a separate company from Huawei, rose 3%, and everybody else fell. Vivo, Oppo, and Apple all declined in China. Revenue for Huawei rose 1% on the years. Not a lot, but hey, it rose. That's 1% up. Uh, Amazon had great earnings in its Q3 with revenue up 13%, beating expectations. Its cloud business, AWS, also did well, but fell just short of expectations in that realm. The difference was made up by ads. While Amazon has plans for ads in retail, as you might expect, both at Amazon.com and in its grocery stores, the big ad revenue generator this past quarter was football. And we're talking American football, y'all. Amazon has an exclusive Thursday night football for the first time this season. And viewership rose 25% as a result because people want to watch football games. That helped ad revenue jump 26%. Amazon also has plans to bring ads to Prime Video as well. So expect Amazon to become a big ad business along with Alphabet and Meta. Shutterstock announced a set of tools that will let you modify real photos from its library of images using generative algorithms. They had held off on allowing this. Now they are. Uh, the image editor is still in beta, but you can generate alternate versions of stock or generated images, as well as expand their backgrounds. Tools like Magic Brush will let you tweak images by brushing over an area and describing what you want to add or replace, like putting grass there. Uh, a smart resizing feature will automatically change an image's shape to match your required dimensions, and it's being rolled out along with an AI-powered background removal tool. Now, if you're wondering how the artists get paid, Shutterstock will pay any artist if their images are licensed after editing. However, you generate or edit an image, you don't get to put that up for licensing. So if that's confusing, you get paid if someone uses AI to modify your art, but you can't use AI to make art and then get paid for it. Dutch students from the Eindhoven University of Technology in the Netherlands built an off-road solar car 
which have successfully gone 1,000 kilometers in rugged desert terrain in North Africa. This is positive news for the broader rollout of solar-powered EVs in areas with limited charging infrastructure. The students started in Tangier, uh, which is in Morocco, driving a two-seated car they call Stella Terra, and made it to the Sahara three days later. The car uses solar panels on its sloping roof to charge electric batteries, and when not in use, the solar panels can be extended to maximize charging while doubling as a shade cover. Yeah. Very nice. Cool. Kind of looks like a pop-up camper the way that, that goes. Yeah, it does. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about uh, AI for once. <laughs> yeah. Uh, AI. Who's heard of that? Uh, so the UN created a 39-member advisory board to act as a bridge between various UN efforts for the international governance of AI. The UN said that the body will be tasked with, quote, building a global scientific consensus on risks and challenges, helping harness AI for the sustainable development goals and strengthening international cooperation on AI governance, end quote. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres noted for developing economies, AI offers the possibility of leapfrogging outdated technologies and bringing services directly to people. Now, the first meeting is Friday, October 27th. The goal is to bring another recommendation by next summer, at which point the UN should hold a summit for the future. So who's on it, Tom? Yeah, this it's an interesting makeup uh, of the 39 people. It's not 39 countries. Uh, there are academics from Trinidad and Tobago, Russia, Saudi Arabia, the UK, Japan, Netherlands, Senegal, Finland. Those are professors, uh, South Africa, China. There's only a few government officials. Uh, they are from Brazil, United Arab Emirates, Spain, Israel, Germany, Egypt, South Korea, Singapore, Kenya, and Mexico. A couple NGO representatives in there, one from the US, one from Pakistan, Argentina, India, and Estonia. And then the company representatives are interesting as well. There's one from Mozilla, but it's a Mozilla employee from Ethiopia. Uh, the Microsoft representative is from New Zealand. Sony's is from Japan. Google's is from Zimbabwe. OpenAI's representative is from Albania. And Hugging Face, uh, which, which makes a stable diffusion model that's open source, uh, has a representative from India. So uh, a very global group uh, from various stakeholders, government, NGOs, companies themselves, uh, trying to work as a bridge to bring all these regulation efforts together together. But even so, Teja, are these the right people to decide the future of AI? Is anyone the right person to decide the future of AI? I mean, better than you and me. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly. Agreed. Right. Baseline. Hey, don't yeah. sell yourself short. <laughs> no, she was Listen, just saying you know. me and her. Sarah, you're yeah. still in Sarah, this. Sarah, you yeah. could make this list. Okay. We yeah, should possibly. actually put you on this list. No, me I mean, listen. not in Tobago, folks. You know, we've yeah. been talking on the back chair. Yeah. I just have a podcast about AI. I don't know enough to be on a governing body to regulate it. So I think it's, like you're saying, a very interesting mix. I noticed there's some people even in like the health space that have mm -hmm. been included on this list, which I find interesting. And maybe they can attest to some things that we wouldn't even think about when it comes to disinformation and misinformation with AI. So I think it's an interesting mix. It's hard to say who's really who really are the right people to regulate this because it's like anything we talk about in tech it moves so fast faster than we even have any regulations in place so i feel like we're already behind so it's kind of like however many people smarter people than us we can get in the same room talking about this and putting some regulation in place the better i think I we'll know have a lot to of see people... what regulations they put in place. Though. Well, yeah, and that that's the key, right? Because a lot of people look at this and say, it's the UN. It's, you know, nobody's going to do what they say, no matter what they say, um, because the UN can't force you to pass a law, despite what some people tend to want to wanna try to imply. Um, so the biggest criticism could be that this is toothless. But like you said, I think they have a very credible group here from multiple disciplines. Uh, when, you, when you brought up healthcare, I immediately thought of like, oh, right, emphasizing that there are certainly AI tools that can help doctors and there should be rules about how they're used and when they're disclosed to patients. Um, but I liked that Secretary Guterres was saying these things can help a lot of countries 
jump into the present, like jump their development uh, uh, ahead. Uh, and and I think that's that's an important thing not to lose here is, yes, there are fears we should guard against. There are bad uh, consequences we should guard against, but we shouldn't let that hold back the good that they can do. And in the sense of maybe they will, don't set regulation, but maybe they help affect the conversation. I think this is probably good. Yeah, it's... It's needed, especially when you think of it in terms of, so I know we think about things here in North America, and even on a broader scale, it's, we have to weigh those risks with the good that comes from it. So just because something is risky doesn't necessarily mean we shouldn't be doing it. And also, yeah. yeah, and also, you know, everyone on this council and how we're thinking of AI at least in North America, is much different than, say, how China is thinking of AI. Mm -hmm. And just because we're scared of something doesn't mean we can't do it. We cannot be last to the race. We have to be able to get regulations in place and allow other countries to also do this safely, securely, maybe privately if it comes to health data and the like. But we have to be thinking about how certain other maybe nefarious places in the world, if you want to say, are going to be using these type of AI tools. And we need to be prepared to be to combat that, quite frankly. Yeah. So hopefully they're talking about that too. I think the yeah, one, the, oh, go ahead, sir. Oh, uh, well, I was going to say, you know, a lot of, you know, Mozilla in Ethiopia, Microsoft in New Zealand, Sony in Japan, well, Sony in Japan, maybe <laughs> kind of makes sense. Google and Zimbabwe. Uh, there, you know, there were a lot of uh, things out of the story where I was like, huh, yeah. I mean, I, sitting here in California, don't necessarily think about how Ethiopians are using Mozilla, but uh, but they do. Um, and, and uh, you know, all of this uh, that makes the AI conversation more global, I think it's going to be messy, but it helps us in the long run. And the more conversations, the better, right? Um, yeah. I, I know that the the U.S. is going to have uh, a, a gathering at the White House to discuss this. Another um, one. It's not the first one. Yeah. Uh, Prime Minister Sunak uh, is trying to be the guy who's going to get China and the U.S. in the same room to, to agree on things on AI. Um uh, the chances are small, but you're saying there's a chance that he might be able to do it. So we'll see if that happens next week. Uh, but it is, I think, encouraging that we are talking about the consequences ahead of time. As long as we talk about them realistically and responsibly, I think it's good to do this now instead of after the fact, like we have done with so many other technological advances. All right, let's talk about some improvements coming to Google Maps. Uh, Google announced a bunch of them. Photo first search results, where a photo from the business listing is surfaced in the icon on the map as well as at the top of the listing. Google says it's using algorithms to choose which photos to surface. There's improved EV charging station listings, navigation getting better at lane guidance. An immersive view uses algorithms to expand the feature that let you virtually travel through the map to make it more like the real world. Uh, it lets you preview every step of a journey, including things like weather changes. If it knows it's going to rain, it'll show if you're you know, previewing your route at what point the rain is expected to start. Uh, 50 more cities are getting lens in maps. That lets you point your camera at what's around you. And then it'll tell you store names or street names and reviews and things like that. Uh, you can now search for less specific phrases in Google Maps. Like you can just type in things to do and it will list activities and break them down by topic. So it'll show you art exhibitions or cherry blossoms. Yeah. If you're, you things know, to do is in, pretty general, but in Japan. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but it, it, it'll break it, break it down into categories of things to do for you. Whereas before it'd be like, I don't know what to do with that. That's, that's too general. Um, these are all great. And the obvious question might be, does this keep Google ahead of Google maps and such? But I'm wondering. Of Apple maps. Is Google maps. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Google should stay ahead of itself, but Google <laughs> ahead of Apple Maps. Uh, I'm wondering, is Google Maps replacing Yelp? Mm. Because I'm using Google Maps less for navigation. I use Waze for most of my navigation. I use Google Maps all the time to find out, oh, is there a restaurant? Is there a Korean restaurant near me? Or, you know, where are the pet stores in this neighborhood? Stuff like that. Yeah. I'm all in on Google Maps. I, Apple Maps, what is that? I'm not, I'm not familiar with her. Um, but I have found in the last few months, 
I'm using it more like a Yelp in terms of kind of like an open table too, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I'm booking Mm -hmm. my restaurant reservations. I've done that a handful of times now. And at first when that became a thing in Google Maps, I thought, well, who the heck would need to book reservations? But it just intuitively makes so much sense. If you're looking for like what they've had at the bottom of their maps for, oh God, probably a couple years now, like latest in your area type stuff, which would be very familiar to like location based location based Yelp um, settings. That makes sense. You know, you're finding a Korean restaurant near you. So, you know what? I'll just book it right here too. I don't have to open another app. I don't have to do anything. It's just happening. So I'm all in. I've always been a Google Maps girly though. So I guess that's just me. But it's like anything that can save us a tap, we are inherently lazy people. I'm speaking for myself. Yeah, <laughs> it's I like mean, anything that saves me a tap. I mean, Google in. Maps used to be like this was the map. I mean, right. there were others, but come on, you know they sucked. Apple Maps kind of sucked at first. It's definitely gotten better. It is a very different experience. Like to the point where, when I'm in my car and uh, you know we're doing. Um, uh, you know, um, Apple Maps inside the car. I don't even try to force it to go to Google Maps, which I used to do, not even five years ago. But looking up uh, on Google Maps right now, if I search for sushi, like you said, Tasia, it's like you can reserve a table, you can order online. There are all sorts of options that all used to be kind of the Yelp thing. Or something that you had to do with the restaurant's domain specifically, which you can still do. But uh, Google Maps is much more than just let's figure out how to get from point A to point B in this amount of time. Um, it's it's a, there's a lot more to it, and I am here for it. Yeah, I, I'm starting to re- to actually believe its ratings <laughs> somewhat, which I used to just ignore them because it'd be like two ratings. Um, and I didn't think about it till Tasia, you said this, but I actually book my haircuts through Google Maps because I found the barber on Google Maps and it was the same thing where I'm like, oh, I guess I can book my appointment. And so that's yeah. now I've gotten in the habit of doing that. Um, so yeah, when, when they added the photo first thing the, here, I was like, oh yeah, no, this is, this is what I'm using Google Maps for. It's, it's my directory. It's, it's the thing yes. that replaced the yellow pages basically. Exactly. And anything, I find any app that can remove a friction point. Mm -hmm. So whatever app that might be, but Google Maps, I find dials in that, that usability for people, the ease of use, it's very intuitive, it removes a friction point for everyone. So to me, not that I would need this as a selling point, but I'm always here for a Google Maps update, you know, but Mm -hmm. it just gets better and better. (laughs) It's easy for this stuff to get bloated. You know, yeah. and you don't want to bloat your apps and do nonsense stuff that you don't need. And like YouTube, I'm looking at you. Mm. Um, so Google doesn't necessarily get it right all the time. But I just think they keep nailing it with this. It's great. I use it too. Like when it's telling you just, you know, you can pull up your map and just based on your location, it's going to tell you like if there's something going on in your area, not even weather related, like not traffic necessarily but it's something that you might need to know about like an emergency or something going on and it's like i just like having all this in one spot it's so nice yeah yeah and i hadn't i didn't even thought about uh the fact that i i've started using apple maps for navigation sometimes like you said sarah where it just kind of comes up and the lane guidance is so good it'll be like go through this stoplight and then turn left from the two left lanes at the next stop it's it, yeah. i'm glad google maps is getting a little bit of that in there too Mm-hmm. Uh, well, folks, uh, we have a whole YouTube channel. Speaking of YouTube, uh, youtube.com slash daily tech news show. And one of the shows I do on there is top five, breaking down five things to know, usually somewhere around the world of technology. And this week it is in the heart of technology. Top five things you should know about risk five. Uh, risk five is an open standard instruction set for chips. But what you actually need to know are the five things in this video uh, is that companies are starting to use it as an alternative to ARM. So you can catch that at youtube.com slash daily tech news show. Well, keeping in the conversation about Google, the company has emphasized the AI features of its new Pixel 8 Pro flagship phone. 
But how well do those features work? Who is testing them out? Well, <laughs> thankfully we have Teja on today who has been doing exactly this with the Pixel 8 Pro. So Teja, what have you learned? Um, the first thing I learned is that I matched it to my shirt. <laughs> I just realized. Oh, that it's, I did it's that. blue. That this is, is bay you know blue. What? Okay, so <laughs> check that one off the box. Good work. Taylor Swift's your blue. Nice. My, yeah, my Pixel 8 Pro is in her 1989 TV era. Um, but <laughs> you guys, so let's just quickly go over like the photo and the video editing capability and stuff. You guys know about Magic Eraser. That's nothing new, but they did release, they always release these really great updates to it. And the one that they up, they updated now is it's better at rendering out, rendering out the background for you. So you can remove larger objects, things with like more noise, and it's going to remove sh like shadows on that object for you too. It's doing a much better job. So that's kind of like a minor thing that's important to know. Major update is something called Magic Editor, where now you can isolate a subject or an object in a photo. You can resize and reposition. And not only will it regenerate the background for you, but one of the examples they like to use is like there was a camping photo and there's a tent that's cut off. They move the tent into frame and it regenerates mm. part of the tent as well. So obviously Magic Editor right now is very initial stages. I've tried it with some images of me. I was not cut off though, but I've tried it with images of me. I slid myself, scaled up, moved myself. You would not know. That's how good it did on the background. So they really want feedback. So if anybody's, you know, playing around with the eight pros and the eights, they want feedback on that for sure. Then they announced something called magic eraser, but for audio, which is a little bit nutty, but basically what they're doing now is cleaning up your videos. And so if you take a video and there's lots of noise in the background maybe there's a kid screaming maybe there's birds chirping chainsaw, maybe. yeah yeah something. there's a chainsaw something's going on it will isolate all of this as separate tracks so it will isolate your track it will then isolate what it's deeming it here so like i did a few examples one of my examples it it isolated nature well because there were birds that were like so loud in the video then it had noise so like it depends what you're doing but it'll isolate that and then you can crank it down or up however much you want on a slider i mean as it's incredible audio editor at times this is my love language i it's mean incredible. the fact that i could be like keep the birds lose the chainsaw i'm in that's Big pretty time. that's pretty dope. You could do that as an editor yourself, but to have that, you know, off the bat is so key. Like to isolate those into their own layers for you. I mean, that's just working some magic in the background. So, that was really cool. Now, something else they announced that's new to Google. So, I will say it's new to Google is best take. So, this is for all the group photo lovers where you can never get everybody looking good in a picture it's just not possible or like you'll have a friend who posts that one group shot and you're like could you have not posted that i looked terrible in that shot like you looked really good <laughs> i wasn't even looking at the camera so now what you will do is just take multiple photos like manually it doesn't do this in the background but you take multiple photos of your group shot then when you go in to edit the image it will automatically pull like facial expressions for you of Sometimes every person in the photo or just sometimes what it can pull, what it can discern from the like images, but it'll put them as little icons underneath your picture and you just tap on the icon. So like you'd be tapping on your little face underneath the picture and you go, oh, here's like whatever, six or seven other options. I like this face on me better. And it face swaps your own face, but it looks incredible like it doesn't look janky like you're like well that was a bad photoshop job it just looks like you're like oh no i was smiling and looking at the camera it's awesome here's why i say this is new to google it is new to google but it's not technically a new feature because i'm pretty sure it was like nokia that had this about 10 years ago but it just didn't go anywhere and i feel like the software just really wasn't as good obviously yeah, it this wasn't is... as smooth i remember that yeah. yeah this is very 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 dialed in guys i've done it on a bunch i even made the camera work extra hard and did it in like night sight incredible like i can't even tell you it's probably one of my favorite things now because it's a just lot of like, people uh, were thinking this was going to be creepy though ahead of time you know and it, i it i was like, one of those people as well yeah, where yeah. i was like oh i don't know now we're just screwing around with this stuff too much but <laughs> i had to remind myself 
all these tools exist. They just were sort of prosumer tools. Exactly. And so now it's like, I look at it as not as creepy as much as it ju it just wants to give you your best take, you guys. So you did look okay in one of the photos, right. just not that photo. You you really looked like that. It's yeah, not, it's not, it's not <laughs> yeah. exactly. It's not morphing and editing, Changing, but she yeah. does a really yeah. nice job of just, even if there's like a slight angle, like that's where Sarah, I feel like when you watch it happen, it gets a bit creepy when it's like your head's like this, and then all of a sudden it's like, Oh, I'm, it's cocked to the right. And you're like, whoa. But it looks very natural. Like nobody would know that that edit actually happened. So there's also stuff coming soon. They're going to be doing feature jobs in, I think, December. All of this stuff, by the way, happens like in your editing settings on device. There is something coming in December that's going to be off device. It's going to send to the cloud and it's video boost. So they're bringing not just video boost for regular videos, but they're also going to be bringing night sight to video. Google's Night Sight, I think, has been really, really good for the past few years. So yeah. this is supposed to be dropping in December. This and something like a video boost where it's going to give you like that more kind of color, true to color mm -hmm. imagery and video. What I'm understanding is that's going to take your video, send it to the cloud to process, and then drop it back down into your go into a different folder i think in google photos so we'll have to wait and see exactly how those work in december then there's also zoom enhance coming soon so like do you guys remember like all the csi shows oh, yeah. they're like looking at security and they're like zoom enhance and it's like okay yeah well, like it doesn't oh, work that way look at his yeah. pinky finger yes. wow we know exactly Thank God we yeah, have exactly. zoom <laughs> exactly <laughs> so now they're bringing literal zoom enhance to the Pixel 8 Pro, we don't know exactly if this is going to also drop in December or be a different feature drop, but they just showed a really small example of taking a photo of the Golden Gate Bridge and then zooming in and it then kind of regenerates each pixel into what it thinks it it's supposed to be. So it's, it is using a lot of AI in the background to recreate the original pixels, but in better focus if that makes sense so those are all the kind of photo and video editing goodness gracious in a nutshell very good very good and of course beast. you've got more on your youtube channel if people want to find out more of what you thought uh, go check out tasia's youtube channel as well yeah there's a lot there including some other generative ai stuff too so whew, it's a lot to pack in well keeping with the google theme on the show if you happen to find a restaurant called Thai food near me, what would you think? Uh, you might see it on the street and say, well, it's physically near me, but there's a little bit more to it. Telly Jirapapanan, one of the four owners of an actual restaurant in New York called Thai food near me, says Google search is exactly why they named it that. He says, everywhere I go, I'm craving Thai food. I have to search Thai food near me all the time. The restaurant is optimized for the kind of searches that diners use to find places nearby. Not necessarily for the person walking past it on the street or getting a recommendation from a friend. You might find it that way, but Thai food near me is pretty specific. He says, when you have a million restaurants close by, you will be in the bottom of rankings if it's a random name. But when we use Thai food near me, people started knowing us. Now, smart. <laughs> uh, in the Verge article so about smart. this, they talked to Danny Sullivan at Google, who said he doubts that this is what helped them. Uh, he's like, Google uses a lot more than just the name to surface stuff. Uh, and when uh, the author of this story, uh, Mia Sato, did searches, uh, they said, yeah, this didn't always pop up at the top, even though I was nearby to it. Uh, so I, I suspect that one of the things that helped it maybe as much or more so than SEO is everyone thinking this is a funny and clever name and telling their friends about it and sharing pictures on Instagram. I saw Ron Richards post about this like a few days ago. Uh, ah. and it's, and it's not the only one there's, there's others around the country that, that Mia mentions in the Verge article as well that are well, doing and we this. Were we were talking in our pre-show meeting and like, who does this? I do this constantly. You know, I was looking for sushi when we were talking about Google Maps yeah, just a few minutes ago. It's like, sushi near me. 
I'm always like, maybe it, that's not the one I'm going to choose, but I want to know like what's close. So Thai food near me just starts to become part of the vernacular, I think. And that's where these, these restaurants might, I don't know, uh, get some, get get some customers. Yeah. Even if it's not from search, uh, the the fact right. that someone's going to look at it that just, and just go just like, okay, have you seen like, this? Oh, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. everybody that knows that like doing in Google search the such and such near me, uh, everybody knows what that means. So I think yeah, it's like cool. if the if the restaurant was called like Thai food down the hole, you'd be like, mm, I don't know, mm, but yeah, uh, I don't get less, it. You less know, there's probably a story behind it, but like Thai food near me, you're like, well, oh, that makes sense. Yeah, and I'm here. Let's do this. <laughs> All right. Well, we have given Len Peralta lots of things to possibly draw today. Uh, Len, what have you chosen to illustrate for us? Well, keeping with the Google theme and AI as well, you know, uh, I've been doing this show for a decade now. You know, I've been on the show for a decade, and every oh, once wow. in a while I'll yeah. do these ads, fake ads, and I think this one is probably my favorite headline I've ever re I've ever written for the Pixel Pro, your new AI phone. Oh. <laughs> I think is pretty Shots cool. Shots fired. So, AI phone. But, exactly. So the name of this one is called Call Google <laughs> because hey man, I uh, I think that's a pretty good headline, man. Anyway, this image actually was created. I was playing around with Photoshop generative AI. Ah. It was created with generative generative AI. Uh, so uh, just I was just playing around with it. Want to do something a little bit different. If nice. you are interested in getting this, well, if you're a Patreon of mine, you get it immediately patreon.com forward slash len you back it at the dtns lover level or you can just get it at my online store lenperaltastore.com and also you can uh, order maybe a holiday card for me this year because i'm doing them so check len, it out. 10 years ago in your wildest dreams would you have thought you would be using ai to create art <laughs> for the show <laughs> no and no and i don't think i'm going to be doing it all the time but i was playing around with it today because i thought it was it was That's interesting cool. to see how it worked so well, Len, good stuff as always. Tasia Custody, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, you are not an AI uh, replica as of yet. Uh, you know, as we know. The, not that I know, you know of. Yeah, you know, the, the year is young. Uh, but let folks know where they can keep up with your work. I'm at Tasia Custody on all the things. So head on over to YouTube, find my YouTube channel there, at Tasia Custody. And also check out one of my many podcasts, which I do with friend of the show, Tristan Jutra, called AI Named This Show. It's happening every Friday. And as you can imagine, there's a lot to talk about. <laughs> yeah, there's no shortage of stuff. That's true. No. Uh, patrons, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. If you are somebody who supports us at patreon.com slash DTNS, you get more show. And on Fridays, we like to lean back and have a little fun. It's time again for the great GDI Debates Join us as we tackle some of the most controversial topics of all time. <laughs> but just a reminder, you can catch our show, DTNS, is live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We hope you all have a wonderful weekend. We're back on Monday with Ayaz Akhtar joining us. Talk to you then. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer, Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer, Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker, Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and co-host, Rob Dunwood. Video producer and Twitch producer, Joe Kuntz. Technical producer, Anthony Lamos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer, Dan Campos. Science correspondent, Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator, Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scottis One, BioCow, Captain Kipper, Steve Guadarrama, Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, a.k.a. Gadget Virtuoso, and J.D. Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A., Acast, and Len Peralta. Live art performed by Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Tatiana Matias. Patreon support from Tom McNeil. Contributors for this week's shows included Justin Robert Young and Scott Johnson. Our guests this week were Annalie Newitz, Trisha Hirschberger, and Tasia Custody. And thanks to all the patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more 
at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>